Hey everybody, it's Sauce, and I am back with the next installment of my backpacking gear review series, and this one is going over all things electronics and camera gear. I do realize the irony in doing a video about all of the electronics I bring into the backcountry, which is typically somewhere I go to disconnect, but there are some very helpful electronics that go into a successful backpacking trip. If you didn't already know, I am doing a gear review of my entire backpacking setup, so be sure to subscribe and check out that full playlist for my entire gear list. There are a few crucial electronics that are part of my gear list that I think will be helpful for anyone who's just starting out backpacking. And then there are also electronics that I personally bring along just because I enjoy creating videos when I'm in the backcountry. So I will first be going over all of those basic electronics, ones that could apply to any backpacker, and then I'll be moving into my camera gear list if you're interested in that. First up is arguably the most important piece of my electronic setup, and that is the battery pack, AKA the power that makes everything else Run. I actually have two different versions of these. This is a 10,000 milliamp hour anchor battery pack and I also have a 20,000 milliamp hour that I can't seem to locate right now. But I've carried the 20,000 milliamp hour on most of my backpacking trips up until this summer when I wanted to cut a little bit of weight for some shorter trips. I brought the 10,000 milliamp hour. But since I do have so many things that I need to charge, if it's a trip longer than like two days, I typically still bring the 20,000 milliamp hour. A few things that I love about the 20,000 battery bank is that it does have two charging ports, which means that I can charge two things overnight while I'm in my tent. So maybe my headlamp and my phone or my phone and my video camera. But overall, I really like having that option so I don't have to wake up in the middle of the night and switch things out if I need to. To give you an idea of all the things that I charge on a backpacking trip, which is why I need so much battery power. It's my headlamp, my camera, my video camera, my phone, sometimes my Garmin, and sometimes my watch. 20,000 has been enough for me on stretches up to seven days long. Um, I do have to be a little bit diligent in the beginning of, say, not charging my phone the first couple nights, so I'm a little bit more conservative with my battery and stuff during the day. But overall, all of those things are able to keep a charge for seven days as long as I am careful about it. So honestly, a 10,000 to 13,000 is probably enough for most people. The particular battery packs that I have don't have fast charging or anything like that. I bought them back in like 2019. I tend to stay overnight in towns no matter what, so I don't feel like I need that fast charging capability, but if you're the kind of person who goes into town in the morning and you're gonna be out by that afternoon, that might be something that you wanna consider and make sure that you have that as a feature in your battery pack. Overall Anchor has been a very reliable brand for me and I have had my 20,000 milliamp hour, like I said, since the PCT. So since 2019, four years of many, many nights of backpacking. So I am really impressed with the longevity of that battery pack specifically. This item is a little bit more applicable to like through hikes because at home it doesn't really matter if you carry a wall block for your charging stuff or not but I do like having this one both at home and on through hikes because of the four charging ports. It just makes it easy to charge a lot of things at once and it's pretty light. There's nothing really fancy about it, but yeah, it's worked well for me. Another side note, I pulled a true through hike remove this year and I purchased a bunch of short charging cords for all of the different types of charging cords I need which honestly probably doesn't save that much weight, but it is kind of nice to have these shorter cords as far as bulk and weight savings in my backpacking setup. Next up is my Garmin Instinct Solar Watch. I have been rocking this thing since the CDT and I really love it. I also did replace the band, so this is more of an elastic band than the one that it comes with, um, which is like kind of a big bulky plastic one, and I do prefer that to the one that it comes with. I love using this to track my hikes. It can track my walking all day long and it creates a GPX track and also uploads all of the stats to my Garmin Connect app. You can also sync the Garmin Connect app with Strava. If you're a Strava person, you don't have to give that up, which is kind of nice. And the watch itself does save multiple days of workouts. So even though it doesn't sync while you're in the backcountry, it needs to be connected to, I believe, Wi-Fi or cell service for your watch to sync with the app. It can sync a bunch of workouts workouts once you're in town. So that's what I typically did on the CDT. I would just track every day and then when I got in town, sync everything up. I never had it like run out of space, but just be sure that you are syncing it regularly so you don't lose any of your tracks. Another thing that I love about this is it is a solar watch, which means that I could probably get away without charging it if I wasn't tracking. However, with the tracking, because that does use a lot of battery, I typically can get two days of tracking out of this without 
using my battery pack. So typically what I do is I you know, track all day and then at night I'll turn it off to kind of conserve battery overnight. And I can usually track a whole second day and then usually have to charge it that night to make sure that I can keep going without it running out of battery. That said, I'm not super diligent about like putting it out in the sun on breaks. Maybe if I was a little bit more diligent about that, it would last a little bit longer, but overall I'm really happy with two full days of tracking without needing to charge it. And like I said, if I wasn't tracking, I think this thing would probably last an entire through hike without being charged. Like right now it says it has eight days of charge and it's like barely got any battery. Um, so when it's not using that extra pole for things like tracking, it can last a really long time. Another thing that's cool about this watch is you can customize the face. You can see a bunch of different things on it. Like right now I have my step count on the face, um, the altitude and the date, and then you can also see things like solar intensity, you can check your pulse off, you can check the moonrise and moonset as well as the sunrise and sunset. There's a lot of different customizable variations that you can put on that watch face, which is kind of fun. And you can do the same thing for your workout setup. So you can say, I wanna track a hike and you can kind of change everything that it shows you while you're doing that specific workout. A complaint that I used to have about this watch is that it wasn't always 100% accurate with the altitude, but I learned that that is kind of just an altimeter thing. Altimeters are the thing that measures altitude and they need to be recalibrated. So that's just an altimeters in general kind of thing. And so you are able to recalibrate this watch to make sure that your altitude readings are accurate. This watch also can sync with other Garmin devices like my inReach, but honestly, I don't use that feature very much because I find it kind of annoying. Overall, I really love the Garmin Instinct Solar. I use it constantly, even at home, and I would definitely recommend it to anyone who is kind of a nerd about their hiking stats and wants to keep track of things. Next up is another one of my favorite pieces of gear, and that is my Nightcore headlamp. I have had this since the PCT in 2019, another piece of gear that is just still going unbelievably strong after four years of heavy use, and this thing is awesome for a few different reasons. One is that it is super, super bright. I have never been in a situation where I was like, man, I wish this got brighter, whereas I have had that issue with other headlamps. So when I'm night hiking and stuff, it's really nice to be able to just crank it up to the highest setting if I'm feeling a little bit nervous and be able to see as much as I want. It does have a red light as well, so you can turn that on so as not to disturb animals and not to disturb other people at camp. This headlamp is also only one ounce, which I think is incredible for a headlamp. I believe it's one of the lightest on the market. And you can even switch out this headband to make it even lighter. One of the reasons this is so light is because it's rechargeable and doesn't have batteries. And I personally prefer that rather than carrying around multiple sets of batteries. Nice to be able to just charge it up on my battery pack. This thing does have a really, really long battery life. I've used it for night hiking multiple nights in a row and not run out of battery. Don't know the exact amount of hours that I've used. I know though that it has lasted me a long time. And so I have a lot of peace of mind knowing it has quite a bit of battery storage. I do occasionally charge it while I'm out in between stretches, just in case if I know I've been using it a ton, just for some peace of mind. And obviously you don't want it to die on you when it's most important. Um, but that being said, I usually just charge it in town. Next up is the Garmin InReach Mini, and this is something that I have carried on all of my hikes this year and will continue to carry for as long as I need to, probably until our cell phones get better satellite communication capabilities. But I like this for a few different reasons. One, of course, being the SOS feature. If you need to call for help in the backcountry for some reason, it is nice to be able to have that. I've used it before to call for help for other people, luckily not for myself. And it's really nice to just give your family that peace of mind. Of course, you should never rely on this and expect to be using it. But again, it's great that we have this technology. It's also nice because the Garmin InReach specifically has preset messages with the plans that they offer. And so I usually set up one message that's just like, I'm at camp safe and it sends a location with it so I can update my family that way, give them a little peace of mind let them be able to check in on me while I'm out on my backpacking trips. They do also have custom text messages. I believe I get up to 10 in the plan that I have and that's handy for things like when I was on the CDT and I saw smoke in the distance, I would text my dad and say, hey, can you check if there's a fire, you know, 20 miles north of this town? And he was able to let me know, hey, you're good, no closures or yeah, you might need to reroute, here's where to go. Another thing that was really handy this year about the Garmin InReach specifically was you can load GPS points into this. And so you can use that for navigation, which I haven't ever done to be honest, but what I have used it for is checking the weather at the locations ahead on my route. So on the Fifner, we had five 13,000 foot peaks on our last day and 
the forecast for where we were camping that night was totally clear. It said 0% chance the next day, but I knew that obviously we were gonna be traveling and in Colorado, you can have a lot of like microclimates and things can be very different from five miles away than they are where you are. So I checked our final 13,000 foot peak and it said something like, 50% chance of rain by 2 p.m., which in Colorado is basically 100% chance by noon. So we knew that we needed to get up really early and beat that storm to our final peak of the day. Keep in mind that most satellite communicators do have like an activation fee and usually like a plan cost. So for the Garmin, it is $35 a year for the activation fee and then $15 a month for the plan itself. I do the cheapest plan. It gives you 10 text messages and unlimited presets. And the reason I do that is I don't use custom text messages very often. If you are going to need to be in constant communication with a partner or something like that, that might be a reason to do a bigger plan. But for me personally, I just don't find it necessary. And you would have to send an additional like 40 texts a month in order to make it justified to go up a plan because it's like 50 cents a text message after the first 10 that you send. So basically for me, it just, the basic plan is totally fine. One thing to keep in mind, if you are going to try and talk to a partner regularly or someone at home very regularly, just warn them that satellite communicators are a little bit unreliable. It has everything to do with when the satellite comes over where you are. So if you're in a canyon or something, you might not see a satellite for several days, potentially just because of the way the canyon is facing and the way the satellite paths go. So you don't want them freaking out if they haven't heard from you. And yeah, it's just important to keep in mind the way that satellite devices work. They're not a fail safe. Um, they are great to have as backup, but they're not going to save you in every single situation. Two options for if you don't wanna spend as much on a satellite communicator, I know they can be a little bit pricey, is one, I got this InReach Mini actually refurbished. So that's always an option. There's some certified refurbished resellers. I think eBay is one of them. And there's no reason for this to be like a super fancy, super brand new. As long as it's functioning, you should be good. I also don't see any reason for me personally to upgrade to the two. So if you can find the first version, the Garmin InReach Mini 1, that should be plenty for what most backpackers need. And then another option is I've heard the Zolio satellite communicator is really great. A lot of people have said good things about it. It's a little bit heavier, but it's a lot more affordable and it just doesn't have a screen and you just basically Bluetooth it to your phone and that's how you use all of the functionalities on it. But yeah, overall, I do think it's important for people to have satellite devices just in case. Another item that to save my butt on more than one occasion is my OtterBox phone case. I have dropped my phone too many times to count while in the backcountry, and this thing has kept me from having to either get a new phone or replace all of the glass on it. So I'm really happy with how this has performed and definitely recommend it just for keeping that iPhone that you spent a bunch of money on safe from the elements. Another thing that I always do with my phone is put tempered glass over it, and that way if I drop it face down, it's also protected. The tempered glass always breaks before the screen itself breaks. And you can even get tempered glass for like your cameras and stuff, so I also do that for my video camera and my Sony. For headphones, I don't do anything special. I just use Apple headphones. They're great, they work for me. Um, I don't mind having a cord and it's one less thing to charge. So for me, that works well. Next up, we are moving on to my camera gear. This is the stuff I carry with me to document my backpacking adventures. Keep in mind that I am by no means a professional, but if you like the content that I've made and you wanna be able to do something similar on your trips, this is the stuff that's worked really well for me. First up is the DJI Osmo Pocket, and I'm actually filming with it right now, so that's why I just have the box here. And I actually had the DJI Osmo Pocket 1 on the CDT, and now I have the DJI Pocket 2. The one was tragically lost out of my backpack on a ski day, I believe. I don't like to talk about it, but anyway, it gave me an excuse to upgrade, I guess. What I really love about these DJI pocket cameras is that they have a built-in gimbal, so they're really easy to like take out when you're hiking and still get like a semi-steady shot. Obviously, you're gonna still be able to tell that you're walking, but it's not going to be like really shaky all over the place the way a typical camera would be. I also like how light it is. They're only four ounces, and so, they're really easy to just bring along, keep in a, like I keep mine in my chest pocket a lot, on my shoulder strap, and it's really easy to just pull it out and take a really nice video. It shoots in 4K, it has a lot of different settings that you can play with, so you can get a really professional look on a really small and lightweight camera. It can also connect to your phone to create a larger viewfinder because the camera is so small, there's just like a small little screen. 
if you're someone who likes to really see the full view, be able to adjust settings and things like that, you can connect it to your iPhone, make that viewfinder a lot bigger. I don't typically use that a lot actually while backpacking because it's just an extra step and I like to be able to take videos pretty quickly so it doesn't interfere too much with my hiking day, but that is something to know and I'm actually using that right now to do this YouTube video. I also like having something besides my phone to film with for a few different reasons. One being I think if I was shooting with my phone in 4K all day, it would kill the battery and just absolutely decimate my memory space. So what's nice about having the DJI Osmo Pocket is I have a separate sort of battery power for filming and I also have basically unlimited amount of memory space because it takes just like the micro SD cards. So I can basically as much space as I wanna carry is what I can have. So I've gotten up to the like 512 gigabyte micro SD cards, which is just a ton of space for shooting. Overall, this is definitely what I use to film the most while hiking, and I highly recommend this little camera to anyone who's interested in filming their hikes. One thing to know about it though, is the microphones are built into the camera itself, so if you're holding it, you have the potential to be covering them up with your hands. I've definitely done this before while trying to sort of vlog on my hikes. So I do want to eventually get some sort of microphone set up for the DJI. Basically what I carry or sometimes carry with me right now is this Rode video microphone. And while I do love this thing, I am honestly just so lazy about taking it out when I'm backpacking. It's just like a whole nother thing to connect and actually doesn't even connect to the DJI that I bought for connecting to my Sony. I use it all the time for my videos that I do at home for my YouTube videos, but I wanna get some sort of microphone set up for the DJI, so that's something to keep in mind. And I think once I get a little bit better about using my camera for taking videos, maybe I'll be a little bit better about using this, but it is um, a little bit bulky and a little bit heavy. So like I mentioned, that Rode video microphone I do sometimes use with my Sony a6100, but I am pretty bad about taking videos with this, mostly because I don't have a great tripod for it and when I'm holding it, I'm just not the steadiest hand. In general, I think I've been a little bit intimidated by this camera in the past. I'm not the best at shooting manually or anything, so it's been a bit of a learning curve for me, but I am really happy with it every time I do take it out for photos and I've gotten some really great wildlife shots on this. So I think I'm slowly getting over my intimidation and starting to use the camera a lot more. One upgrade I do want to make to this is a new lens. This is a 55 to 210 millimeter lens, which if you know about cameras, you know is like super zoomed and super cropped. So it's kind of hard to get nice portraits or get things close up. It kind of crops in the bigger landscape, which for through hiking just isn't like the best uh, focal length in my opinion. I do want to upgrade that soon and I think that will encourage me to take it out a little bit more. Another thing that I wish um, I had done with the Sony a6100 is it's not weatherproofed and I believe this a6400 is. You'll have to fact check me on that but the a6100 is not weatherproofed and when you're doing something like through hiking you're out in the elements you're in dusty places like New Mexico it can definitely like impact the camera. I took this to a camera shop in West Yellowstone to have it cleaned on the CD and I think the guy nearly pooped his pants when he saw the shape of my sensor. He was able to clean it for me and get her back in good shape, but I think that was a wake up call for me that weatherproofing is gonna be the move on the next camera that I buy. So as you may have seen in some of my videos, I do carry my Sony a6100 on my shoulder with this Peak Designs camera clip. There is a plate that goes on the bottom of the camera as you can see right there, and it just kind of slides in like that. So you can see that's in there, it's not going anywhere. And then when you're ready to use it, you just push in this button and you pull it back out. And so what I really like about having that peak design clip is it keeps the camera very accessible. I honestly think if it weren't for having that, I would use my camera way less than I do. And I'm already, like I said, a little bit intimidated by it. So I think that's a really important factor for me is having it really quickly and easily accessible. I do think that clip is very sturdy. You wanna check occasionally, make sure the screws are tightened and everything. Cause as you're walking, it kinda can shift around. You just wanna make sure things aren't getting loose. But Overall, it's, I've never had it fall apart on me or anything like that. I trust my camera in it. The only time that I've had any issue is my error. I thought I was getting my camera into the slot and I didn't and I missed and I dropped my camera on the ground. Luckily my backpack was sitting down so it was only like a six inch drop but it did dent the kit lens that came with my camera which is why I now have that ridiculous zoom lens on there. Another thing that is important to know about this clip though is depending on the backpack strap that you have, it could either sit on your shoulder itself, like the back plate might be 
all the way around your strap or right now on this backpack, what I really like about it is I have it on this webbing right here, which means that the plate is not sitting directly on my shoulder. I have foam in between, um, which I definitely prefer after you know six months or miles and miles or a full day of backpacking, having that metal plate directly on your shoulder can definitely create some soreness. Um, I think part of that problem is that massive lens that I have, but yeah, just keep in mind that you might want to either switch shoulders every once in a while or try and find a pack where you could put the Peak Design Clip over the foam so you don't have to deal with that plate directly on your shoulder. As far as memory, like I said, I do carry micro SD cards for my Osmo Pocket and then I carry regular SD cards for my Sony, both of which I make sure have 4K capabilities. That's just something you need to check when you're purchasing SD cards. They're so light, it's super easy to carry a bunch. To be honest, I am not the best about backing up my footage, so I don't have any like special system for that. I originally was gonna do it via my phone and then like upload via Wi-Fi when I was in town, but that honestly just was taking ages and was a pain in the butt. So I am just super careful with not losing my SD cards. And another solution you could do is maybe send them home to a friend that you trust, have them loaded onto a hard drive for you. Um, I've done that for a friend before, but basically, um, I don't have any great solutions when it comes to that, so I may not be your person to come to for that. Another crucial part of my camera setup is this little Joby tripod that I got forever ago, um, right before I left for the PCT. I love this little guy for a few reasons. One being I like how it has the ball joints for the legs rather than having straight legs like some of the tripods are. It makes it a lot more versatile and a lot easier to set up in a lot of the different environments that you're gonna find in the backcountry. So if you find a nice rock on the side of the trail, most likely it's not gonna be 100% um, flat. So this is nice because you can kind of adjust the height of the legs by turning it up like that, or you know, just have it sit the right way that you need it to. I have wrapped this around my trekking pole before. It's a little bit wonky. I wouldn't recommend it necessarily, but it's possible. And then this little attachment makes it so I can put my phone on there. So even if you're someone who's just shooting with an iPhone, that's nice. Um, you can just get some nice solo pics of yourself if there's no one around to take photos of you. This does screw into the bottom of the DJI Osmo Pocket too. So it's easy to kind of just set up on the side of the trail when I want a quick video and there's no one around. I do think I'll upgrade to something a little bit more sturdy that can also support my Sony just because not having a tripod for the camera, I noticed just meant I didn't use it as much for video and I would like to use it a little bit more. So I think I need something just a little bit sturdier that would support the weight of the Sony, but that's the only thing to keep in mind with this. It's just definitely meant for like phones and smaller cameras. And there you have it. That is all my electronics and camera gear that I take with me while backpacking. Everything I use to create the videos that you see here. If you have any questions for me, please leave them in the comments and I will do my best to get back to you. Um, and be sure to stick around for the rest of my backpacking gear reviews and future backpacking adventures. Thanks for watching.